Good evening and welcome to the International Intelligence Briefing. I'm Hal Lindsey. Because I believe that one of the most important uh, doctrines for the church right now, the rapture, is being lost, I'm going to do the next two shows on a book I wrote some time ago called The Rapture. We're going to go over the most important issues about this and it's going to be called Vanished into Thin Air. And this is part one. My book and this video is about the rapture. Now I realize that this is a word that causes reaction all over the Christian world. Some believe in it, some don't. Those who do believe in it believe different things about when it's going to occur. You know, the word rapture is not found in the Bible, and sometimes people make a lot of that. Well, uh, the word trinity is not found in the Bible either, but it describes something that is presented in the Bible. And so, right now, let's define what exactly is the rapture. There are a few basic passages in the New Testament about this. It was only revealed when the Apostle Paul began to talk about this. Before that, it was never known as a subject before. First of all, the rapture. The word rapture comes from the Latin Vulgate, Latin translation of the Greek New Testament. Rapturo is the word used to describe the Greek word harpazo. Harpazo is a word that was used at the time of the New Testament to describe a pickpocket with stealth, snatching a person's wallet and taking it away. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, it says this, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The word caught up is the word translated rapture in Latin. And it is the translation of the word harpazo. And it means that with stealth, the Lord himself is going to snatch out of the earth every living believer. And it says they're not going to be brought back to the earth, but caught up to meet him in the air, in the clouds, with those who have died during the church age that are already resurrected. So that gives us some real understanding about the uniqueness of this coming of Christ. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we have another very key passage on this, where it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And remember, that's talking about Christian death and referring only to the body, because the soul and the spirit doesn't sleep. So it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. This mort mortal shall put on immortality. And then that which was promised shall be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, these are some basic passages with some others that can be intercut with this. But this gives us an idea of exactly what we're talking about in the rapture. So let me give you some main points about the meaning of this. So as we progress, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. First of all, it says that the rapture is a mystery. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26 says that there were certain things that were hidden in ages past but are now made known in this present age, and they're made known to the believers. The word mystery in the original Greek is mysterion. This is the word 
that was used of the old Greek fraternities. And they had mystery rites, which simply meant things not known before you enter the fraternity, but made known to the one who becomes a member. And in this sense, this is talking about the fact that this was never known in ages past. But now, the mystery of the rapture is made known to those who have become believers. And then it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this corruptible shall put on incorruption. So we learn that rapture means in another sense, there is no physical death for the believer who is alive at the time it occurs. No death. And then there's a word that is used that is very, very important because it says, we shall be changed. We shall all be changed. This is a word that means to transform from one state to another. And it means that when this occurs, when Christ comes in this coming, that every living believer is going to be caught up to meet him in the air and in the twinkling of an eye, the word atomos in Greek is used here, which means a time so short it isn't divisible. In a nanosecond, every living believer is going to instantaneously be transformed from one state to another. And the state is called immortality and incorruption. We're going to receive a resurrection body. Philippians chapter 3, verses 21, 22, talks about this. It says, verse 20, 21, and so on, it says simply this, for our citizenship is not on this earth, but in heaven, from which we, we expectantly await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall transform these bodies of humiliation into bodies of exactly like his. So the transformation is going to be into a state exactly like Jesus Christ. We will be for the first time qualified and living in bodies that are suited for entering the very presence of God. Now this is extremely, extremely exciting. And there are other things about the rapture. It will take place instantaneously but it's also a reunion because it says we shall be caught up together with them referring to the dead in Christ being raised first we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord oh, just think of it all of our loved ones who have died before us when the rapture comes we will be reunited with them and with many others we didn't even know were in our family tree. The rapture is also a meeting in the air. This is not something that takes place on earth, and this is a very important distinction between that and what is said about the second coming of Christ, wherein he comes directly to the earth. Because it says we're going to be caught up to meet Christ in the air. And then what? Well, Jesus tells us that there's a very important place that we go to at that point. Because John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I shall come again to take you where I am, that you may be with me where I am. Now, he's building a place fit for translated saints right now. And when he catches us up to meet him in the air, we're going to go to his father's house. There's also another very important thing that the rapture means here. Because we know there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ. And this is the place where all of those translated believers will be taken to be judged not to determine salvation or loss of it, or not being saved at all, I should say, but to determine what rewards we have. So the rapture, in a nutshell, then, means that it's a mystery. It wasn't known before now. 
The rapture means no death, the believer who takes part in it. The rapture includes every believer because it says, we shall all be taken, we shall all be changed. And it also is something that happens instantaneously. It says it'll happen in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to go to the Father's house. And uh, then it simply is something that we know as unique. Now, how do we look at this in the light of church history? You know, there's a lot of controversy about this. Uh, good men in the church who are true believers disagree about this. Now, there are some that even say that there's not going to be a rapture, that this is simply uh, a recent invention of Christians that started sometime in the early 19th century. Uh, there are some who say, therefore, the whole thing is suspect. Now, why is there such a divergence of views between so many men? Well, it can be traced to basically one thing, the method of interpretation. You can look back in church history and see when prophecy ceased to be a relevant subject. At the Alexandrian School of Egypt, they had what was probably the first theological seminary in history. It was at this school that the allegorical method of interpretation was developed starting with Philo, who believed that Greek philosophy was divinely inspired. And he wanted to merge the teachings of the Bible with the teachings of Greek philosophy. And therefore, he created this new method of interpreting the scripture, where he gave passages that were uh, normally meant to be taken at face value, literally. Uh, he gave them allegorical meaning so that he could merge the two together. This was taken up by Origen in the early 4th century, and uh, it was further developed in that school. Now, this was very different from great church theologians of that time, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and men who developed in the school at uh, Tarsus and uh, in those areas. Now, as we look at what happened, the allegorical method became an essential part of the standard church interpretation. By the time of Augustine, Augustine still interpreted scripture enough to interpret justification by faith and so forth correctly, but he had totally given over prophecy into the realm of what I call allegorical alchemy. They said that prophecy just was not intended to be taken literally. Now that was the beginning of the Dark Ages. When this period took place, the interpretation of the scriptures was taken from the common man and turned over to the church as the Roman church in Rome began to claim primacy. And over a period of a century or so from that time on, the bishop at Rome claimed to be superior to all and claimed to be the Pope. Now, for a thousand years or more, the church was plunged into darkness, and especially the subject of prophecy. It became absolutely irrelevant, and it remained until the time of Martin Luther. Martin Luther caused the uh, whole Reformation movement because as he wrestled with his own guilt and he wrestled with his, with his terrible doubts about his faith, he was an Augustinian monk, they finally assigned him to teach in the seminary the subject of the Greek New Testament. Greek is a very hard language to get away from because it's a very explicit language. So as he was studying the, epist the epistles of Paul, Romans, Galatians especially, he began to see that this was not intended to be taken allegorically, but literally. And the Reformation was born as Martin Luther began to see that these things were to be taken normally and literally, just as any other literature. And so the Reformation took place in the 15th century. 
but it never really extended at first to the area of prophecy. It wasn't until the 17th century that men began to apply in some respects the, uh, the literal grammatical historical method of interpretation to prophecy. When they did, there was an immediate change in the value and the meaning of prophecy. There were certain men like Wycliffe, who even before the Reformation was saying that Scripture should be taken literally and normally if that's the way it was written. He said that allegory should only be followed if the context demanded it and clearly was allegory. But all other passages should be taken at face value and should not be allegorized because they didn't fit some peculiar system or because they simply seemed hard to believe. Now as this began to develop, we find that in the by the time of the 18th century, there began to be men like Bishop Hooker, who was one of the early members of the church who clearly showed that there had to be two phases of Christ's coming and the second coming. He talked about the secret coming of Christ for the church, wherein he would catch the saints up suddenly to meet him in the air and change them into immortals. And he said this would be a considerable time before the end of the tribulation when he would come back to the earth and judge the earth and he would then judge those surviving believers who were still mortals on the earth. Now, this continued until the early 19th century when a man named John Darby made some very clear systematic studies of prophecy. Now, many say that that's when the subject of the rapture was really discovered. But a careful study of history shows that's not at all the truth. Because there was a man named Ephraim of Nisibis. Ephraim of Nisibis was a Syrian, and he was called the greatest uh, churchman of Syrian history, a great preacher. He clearly, and he lived in the time 306 to 373, he clearly sets forth the doctrine of the rapture. He was apparently one of those who came from the Antioch school of theology, which believed in taking prophecy in the whole Bible literally, unless the context demanded otherwise. He clearly sets forth the whole subject of the rapture and shows there had to be two distinct comings of the Lord because you couldn't fit this, the descriptions of these two comings together. They couldn't be blended. They had to be a considerable time separating them too. They couldn't be simultaneous. And so John Darby, though, was the first one to really categorize and make a theological subject uh, discipline out of the subject of prophecy. And he himself writes how he discovered it. It's very interesting. He did not come up with an understanding of the rapture by studying prophecy, but rather he was studying the whole doctrine of the church. As he studied, especially in uh, the epistles of Paul, the clear definitions of the church being unique, the church also is called a mystery, something never known before it was born and only now really understood by those who were members of it, true believers. He discovered that the church was a very different program than God had for Israel. And so they therefore had to be kept very distinct and they had to be recognized as two separate workings of God in history. As he studied this, he began to see that the church was something that had to be taken out of the way before God could complete his program for Israel. All of this revolves around one of the greatest prophecies of the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. The chart that you see before you is a chart that will show you some of the distinctives of this great prophecy. And uh, yet, just in brief, for the short time I have, 
This was a prophecy wherein God gave an allotment of 490 years to Israel to complete the purpose for which they had been called that already failed on their first 490 years. Why 490 years? Because these were 70 sabbatical years. They failed to keep them in the first allotment of time for them. And so he allots them another 490 years. And then he lays out very carefully how this allotment of time would be divided in history. Now the first phase of this allotment of time to Israel is divided into two stages. The first stage is seven sabbatical years, or 49 years. Now that's the time when the exiles from Babylon and Persia returned to rebuild the city and the temple in Jerusalem. After that, we have another segment that is 62 sabbatical years, or 434 years. The total of that's 483 years. So it is that point that it says that uh, after those 483 years, literally, that is after the seven weeks and the seven weeks of years and then the 62 weeks of years, after that comes to a stop, it says Messiah shall, be, uh, shall come and he shall be cut off, but not for himself. Messiah the Prince shall come and shall be cut off, but not for himself. That means he would be put to death. After something stops, God's great time clock of allotment time for Israel at exactly 483 years. And then there's another historical event that is to take place after it stopped at 483 years, but before the final seven years, the final sabbatical year, that's still allotted to Israel. Now that second event, it says, and the people of the prince who shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary with a flood. And until the end, wars and desolations are determined. Now we know that event took place in 70 AD. The city and the temple rebuilt by the Babylonian Persian exiles was the one that was destroyed by Titus and the Roman legions in 70 AD. Now let's look at this for a moment. If the time clock had kept running, look at the chart on this, if the time clock had kept running, then these two historical events would be outside of the sphere of the time allotted to Israel. It shows that the time clock had to be stopped at 483 years for some very important reason to God. And then these two events, Messiah the Prince would come and be put to death. And the second event, the city and the sanctuary would be destroyed by Titus and the Roman legions. He's of the people who, of the prince who is to come yet. Now, when does the final seven allotted years come for Israel? It's after these events, and it talks about a long period of wars and desolations in Israel, when it says that at the final week shall begin with a covenant signed between this coming prince, who's of the people who destroyed the city in 70 AD. The coming prince, therefore, has to be out of the Roman people. He will sign a covenant, it says in verse 27, with the many, referring to Israel. And it says that uh, he is the one who comes on wings of abomination, the abomination that makes desolate. And it talks about the fact that this seven-year period will be divided in half. It says in the middle of the week, their sacrifice and offering shall be cut off, which means the temple worship would have had been started before this. And it says until the full end, wars and desolations are determined again. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means there's a great parenthesis between the cutting off of this time clock and it restarting to give Israel its final seven allotted years. What was the event that stopped it? Well, it says after it stopped, Messiah would come. And Messiah the Prince would come and be put to death. You see, 
this time clock stopped on exactly the 173,880th day. That's, that's 483 years times the biblical year of 360 days, lunar years. At exactly the end of this period, it was Palm Sunday when Jesus, for the first time, allowed himself to be publicly proclaimed by his followers as the heir apparent of the throne of David, the Messiah, and the Son of God. He was ceremonially and completely rejected by the leaders and by the majority of the people. That's when the time clock stopped. Now it says after that he would be put to death but not for himself. And certainly that's what happened. And then the awful judgment of the Jewish people in 70 AD when they were massacred in the number up into the millions and they were scattered all over the world. The city and the sanctuary were destroyed. But there's yet seven years remaining on that time clock. Now it's in that time frame that we have to see some very important things revealed in the mysteries of the New Testament that were not known then. Because you see, in, the, in this parenthesis, there was born the mystery of the church, something never known before. Jesus announced it for the first time in Matthew chapter 16 when he says upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it he predicted that he was going to build a church which means in the original the called out ones he was going to build a nation of those called from every nation and he intended to build this assembly of called out ones from every nation composed of both Gentiles and Jews, put together as one in one body. Now this was a mystery never known before the New Testament. Next week, we'll look at the event of the rapture itself, so you won't want to miss it. Be sure and tune us back in. God bless you, and we'll talk to you next week. Stand by for an important announcement. This program was sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Only with your love gift of support to TBN can this program stay on the air. So write to TBN, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. The most important doctrine a Christian needs to understand today is the doctrine of the rapture. That's why I wrote, Vanished into Thin Air. This book will take you through the controversy of exactly when Christ is coming for the church and why we need to understand it. I show from the scripture why I believe that Jesus Christ is coming for the church at any moment. Don't miss understanding this important truth.